Before we talk about computing confidence intervals, we need to take a brief look at measurement statistics in general. The purpose of this lecture is to understand the Gaussian probability density function, mean and average values and standard deviations about the mean, and to be able to estimate the mean and standard deviation of a population based on observations or measurements. I like to use practical examples to discuss concepts, so here we're going to use a load cell measurement example. Most of you will recall that a load cell is a transducer, or in particular a sensor, that measures force and converts that force into an output voltage. In this example I'm going to apply a standard 10 pound force to the load cell, so I know exactly that the force that I'm going to apply to the load cell is 10 pounds. After I do this I'm going to measure and record the output voltage and this becomes an observation or a single sample. Then I'm going to remove the load and then I'm going to put the load back on and I'm going to repeat this measurement process to obtain 10 observations or 10 samples for the output of the load cell in terms of voltage. It's important to note here that the input is the force and the output that we're observing or recording is our voltage measurement. From this process, I obtained 10 different voltage measurements for the same input value of 10 pounds force. One way to summarize this information would be to add all of the values up and divide by the total number of samples that were taken, which in this case is 10, to obtain the mean or average value of all of the outputs with 10 pounds of force applied to the load cell. Of course, this tells us about the likely output when we apply 10 pounds of force to the load cell, but it tells us nothing about the variability in the measurements. Before discussing how to compute the variability in a set of measurements, we need to discuss probability density functions. And before that, we need to discuss histograms. To create a histogram, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all the readings from my load cell and I'm going to order them from lowest to highest. And then I'm going to decide on some ranges that are going to equally divide the uh, outputs uh, that we have from our load cell. In this example, I've chosen a bin size or a range size of one, one one hundredth of a volt. Then I'm simply going to go through my list and count the number of times that I get a, an output voltage from my load cell that falls within this bin range right here. Here from the table we see that no measurements fall between the value of 0.38 and 0.39 volts. And we have two measurements that fall within the range of 0.39 to 0.4 volts. If I do this for all of my bins until I've exhausted the entire range, I come up with a number of observations which I can then plot as a histogram. The histogram is a visual depiction of the number of observations that fall within a given output range. This is the histogram for the 10 measurements of the load cell output voltage when I applied the 10 pound force to it. Of course, I always advocate the use of software to help us do this. So we can use Excel's histogram tool or for large sets of data, if you want more functionality, you can use the count if function. And you can go to Excel's help feature to determine how the COUNTIF function works for large data sets. We can see from this histogram that the majority of measurements, at least four of the measurements, fall near the mean value that we calculated earlier for the output voltage from the load cell when we apply 10 pounds of force. Now we're going to look at what happens when we make more than 10 measurements. As we increase the number of observations or samples that we take with our load cell from 10 to 25 to 50 to 100, we can see that we can do a couple of things with our histogram. First of all, since we have a larger number of samples, we have better resolution and we can define our bin sizes to be much smaller as we get more and more samples. However, the thing that you'll also notice is that um, we have the same characteristics that the largest number of observations fall near the mean that we calculated previously. As we take a greater number of samples, we get some 
measurements that fall further away from the mean, but we also get a larger number of observations that fall near the mean value. And you can probably see where we're going with this. As we look at 100 samples and beyond, we start to get a distribution that looks something like the bell curve that you're familiar with. The bell curve, or the Gaussian distribution, is a probability density function. How we get a probability density function is to divide the number of observations in each bin by the total number of observations that were used to obtain or generate that histogram. And of course, if we divide by um, the number of observations in each bin by the total, if we added all of those fractions up or all of those percentages up, the total must be 100%. Now, if we could take an infinite number of samples, which no one would really want to do with a load cell because that would take an infinite amount of time to do, but if we could take an infinite number of samples, what we could do is we could decrease the bin intervals to zero. This, in turn, would result in a continuous curve, which is the probability density function. Essentially, the probability density function is the limit of the histogram as we decrease the bin sizes towards zero because we are taking an infinite number of samples, as is depicted in the picture right here. As the bin size gets smaller and smaller, or the output ranges get smaller and smaller, we approach a continuous function, which is our probability density function. And we see that due to the random uncertainty in our measurements with the load cell, this approaches and starts to look like a bell curve. The proper name for the bell curve is the Gaussian probability density function. The Gaussian probability function is given by this formula right here, and we're going to define the parameters of the mean and standard deviation in just a moment. Based on our definition of a probability density function, the area under this Gaussian distribution curve, if we were to integrate from negative infinity to positive infinity, must be exactly 1. While the value of f of x, or the Gaussian distribution function, doesn't mean much to us, if we integrate under the curve, it provides the probability of obtaining some observation between the two limits of integration. That's why if we integrate from negative infinity to positive infinity, we have a 100% probability, or a value of 1, chance of seeing an observation, an output voltage reading that falls between those two limits. The Gaussian distribution has a bell shape that is centered about the mean, which means that there's a high likelihood of making an observation close to the mean value and uncertainties are going to randomly occur on either side of the mean value. The standard deviation provides a measure of the expected uncertainty about the mean. In other words, it tells us about the width of the curve about the mean value. When we have a large standard deviation, the curve is going to be wide, and when we have a small standard deviation, the curve is going to be very narrow about the mean. Since we can't take an infinite number of observations, we can't get the true probability density function for a population or a possible set of measurements. Therefore, we have to estimate the mean and the standard deviation based on a limited number of observations. We can estimate the mean of a probability density function based on a number of measurements n by taking the mean of those measurements that we have recorded. The standard deviation of a probability density function can be estimated from a set of observations using this formula right here. This formula tells us that we first need to take the mean of all of the observations, and then for each individual observation, we're going to take the difference between that individual observation and the mean value, square it, and add all of those up. After we do that, we're going to divide by the number of observations that were used, minus 1, and take the square root of it. Of course, many software programs like Excel can help you do this. So in Excel, to compute the sample mean, we can just take the average of our set of observations. We can also estimate the standard deviation of the probability density function by the STDEV function. Um, and in newer 
forms of Excel, we need to add this dot s because it uses this exact formula right here. When you're computing the sample standard deviation, it's important to understand that you must be using this formula right here. There are some other ways to calculate the standard deviation um, that are appropriate if you can actually sample all of the, or make an observation of the entire population, which will not be possible for most of the applications that we are going to discuss. Now that we can estimate the mean and the standard deviation of a population, we can start to discuss this concept of confidence intervals. If a population is normally distributed, which also means the same thing as it has a Gaussian distribution, we will find that 68.2% of the observations will lie within one standard deviation of the mean. That is, if we take the mean value that we've estimated and subtract one standard deviation value from it, and we start to integrate under the um, Gaussian distribution curve from that point up to one standard deviation above the mean, the total area under that curve is going to represent 68.2% of the uh, possible op observations. If we extend that integration from, plus, uh, from minus uh, two standard deviations up to two standard deviations above the mean, that's going to account for approximately 95.4% um, of the population. Integrating from three standard deviations below the mean to three standard deviations above the mean is going to account for 99.6% of the possible observations or the possible measurements um, that we could see from that population. Some of you may have heard of the Six Sigma management processes. The name is derived from the concept that we are discussing right here. Integrating the Gaussian distribution from six standard deviations below the mean to six standard deviations above the mean accounts for 99.99966% of the total observations that are possible within the population. The Six Sigma management process arises from the fact that companies desire to have a high reliability in their products with only a minimal amount, which is the residual here, between 1 minus this, of 0.00034% defective materials and products. Returning to our original load cell example, we can take the 10 measurements that we've acquired from our load cell when we applied 10 pounds of force to it, and we can estimate the mean of the population from these numbers, and we can also estimate the standard deviation. Based on this, we can state that when 10 pounds force is applied to this load cell, a single measurement will result in an output of 0.411 volts with an uncertainty of 0.01 volts, which is our standard deviation. This estimate of the standard deviation is what's called a standard error definition, and this represents a confidence interval of between um, one, uh, one standard deviation below the mean and one standard deviation above the mean, which is about 68.2% of the time. Therefore, the confidence interval associated with this standard error measurement is approximately 68.2%. However, remember that we were not able to take an infinite number of measurements, so the mean and the standard deviation are only estimates of the mean and standard deviation of the population. If we took more measurements, we would have better certainty in our mean and standard deviation estimates. In class and in future videos, we're going to discuss how we can correct for the fact, or correct our um, confidence interval approximation for the fact that we did not take an infinite number of measurements and these are only estimates of the population mean and standard deviation.